Hey boys and girls, so this week many of us have been learning about Kavod for the Knesset, for the Mishkan, and for what Shabbat and Shul should look like. And I know that some of us don't always get a chance to see different shuls and different Bate Knesset. You know, one of my favorite things when I drive across country is stopping at all the cool Bate Knesset and shuls that there are all around this country. But today, we have a special opportunity to visit one of our local shuls and see how amazing it is and what goes on inside of a shul. Come, let's take a look. Well, boys and girls, here we are at KMS, the Camel Synagogue, to meet, greet, and talk about what shul behavior should look like and what goes on in shul. Hello, Rabbi Weinberg, how are you? Oh, Rabbi Pepper, welcome. So nice to have you. Thank you for letting us. Thank you, thank you for welcoming us to your beautiful show. Absolutely, I'm so excited to have you. Come on in. I'm also really excited to be with all of you at the Oneg today. I'm sorry I'm not there in person, but I'm happy that you're coming in through the screen into our shul. I know many of you have been here before, or many of you have been to your own shuls before, but I'm excited to tell you a little bit about this space. Rabbi Pepper, do you have any questions that you want to ask me? Rabbi, why do we call a shul a shul? That's a great question. Actually, the original name in the Gemara is Beit HaKneset, the House of Gathering. It's supposed to be a place where Jews gather to do the most important things, to daven, to learn Torah, and to be together as one, as a community, which is actually, there's another word used in English sometimes that you might hear called synagogue, like the name of this place, Camp Mill Synagogue, which is actually not really an English word at all, but that word synagogue also means to gather. It's a place of gathering. But shul is actually a Yiddish word. It's from the Yiddish or German word shul or school, which is interesting why a shul is called after a school, is named after a school. It could be because in school you learn, and the main part of coming into a shul is also to learn, to learn about Torah and tefillah, or because in school a lot of kids gather together, like you are right now, and when you come to shul, that's really the goal. We really want everybody to gather together. That could be. And why do we have a shul? Well, that's a big question. Big question. I'm sure a lot of you have not even thought about this question. I sometimes don't even think about this question because I take a shul for granted. I think the main reason why we have a shul is because we want to have a place where we connect to Hashem. And even though Hashem is everywhere, when you set aside a special place to do that thing which is really important to you, it makes the whole experience different. Think about if you want to play uh, basketball. Okay? You could take a ball, go on any street, any driveway, and you can play. You can have a good time. It'll be fine. But what happens if you walk onto a beautiful basketball court with great nets and lines and everything is set up right? You come in and you feel like, wow, this is a basketball game. Or you want to do art or something like that. You take your pencil case, a piece of paper, you can go anywhere. You can sit at any table at any place and do art. It'll be fine. But if you came into an art studio, and there's other people there who are also doing art. You want to talk to them. You want to get advice from them. And you have all kinds of colors and paints and papers and all different things to work with. You say, wow, look where I am. This is so exciting. So we can connect with Hashem every, anywhere. But when we set aside a special place for Hashem, that makes the whole experience different, like we did in the Mishkan or like we did in the Beis HaMikdash. We do that in our shuls as well. And actually, I'll tell you one more thing on that. Avram Avinu, we're told in the Torah, was the first place, first person to set aside a special place for tefillah, a special place for davening. So when we set aside a shul as a place to daven, to learn, we're going all the way back to the time of Avram and Sarah, who not only set up their home, but set up special places to connect with Hashem as well. Wow. You know, Rabbi Weinberg, it's such a beautiful shul. Why does the shul have to be so beautiful? Well... Actually, and thank you, I think it is a beautiful shul. Many shuls are beautiful in different ways. A shul doesn't have to be beautiful, but we try to make it beautiful because the way a place looks, it impacts, it has an effect on how I feel. When you walk into a place that's really beautiful, you say, wow, you realize you're somewhere very, very special, and you treat the place differently. You act differently, you think differently, you feel differently. So we want to show that this is a real priority for us. It's a place that's very important for us. So we spend a lot of time on it. We think very carefully about it. We make it look very beautiful to show that Hashem is important to us and davening is important to us as well. Wow, that's so interesting. So are there things that we should or shouldn't do in a show? Definitely. 
Um, there's a lot of things we should do in shul, and that's great. We talked about that already. There are many things that you're not allowed to do, um, and they mainly are the types of things that are about me and not about Hashem. The main things you're supposed to do in a shul are things related to Torah and mitzvot and Hashem. You're not really, little, really allowed to do things that are about you. So you're not allowed to eat in a shul. You're not allowed to sleep in a shul. You're not allowed to like run and burst into a shul. Boom, I'm here. And you just go running in like it's any other place because it's a very special, very holy, very special, separate place. Now, you may be wondering to yourself, well, Rabbi, if we can't eat in a shul or sleep in a shul or run in a shul, how do we do all these things in so many of our shuls? And I'll tell you that nowadays our shuls are very different. So over here, we're going to go in in a couple of minutes, but we have a big, big room where we daven, and that's a special place for davening. Over here, we have another room, which is a smaller room called the Beit Midrash. That's where we daven. Downstairs, we have a few rooms like that. But those rooms are very special and separate for davening, and so we can't do those other activities there. You can't drink in the, in the shul, you can't eat in the shul. But out in the hallway or downstairs in the big room where we have kiddush or we have meals, some shuls even have like a basketball court or a gym. Those are all good things to do, but not in the space where we set aside for davening. Wow, thank you. Uh, Rabbi Weinberg, why do we not have to take off our shoes when we come into a shul? Well... We do have to treat a shul with respect, and there are certain things you do have to take off. Let's say you have a lot of mud on your shoes, or they're really dirty, or and, you know, messy. You can't come into a shul like that. And actually, oh. there are other things, like if you're wearing big, big snow boots, and they're dripping everywhere, and it's messy, you know, like in the winter, or you're wearing a big, big coat, you don't come into shul like that, because that's not really a respectful way to come into a very special place. Think about like the most special room in your house. You wouldn't just burst in there like however you are and put mud all over the carpet. You treat it with much more respect. But at the same time, even though taking off your shoes might be a sign of great, great holiness, like you might remember the story of Moshe Rabbeinu. When Moshe Rabbeinu went and saw the snap, the burning bush, Hashem says, take off your shoes before you come any closer, because this place is very, very holy. Well. This place, the shul, is also very holy, but it's not quite at that level. We don't want people to feel so scared, like when they come into shul, I gotta take off my shoes, I can't move, I can't walk, that they're gonna say, this is not a place for me. If they're so scared, they can't even think about davening and about everything they wanna get out of a shul and about being with their friends. So we want it to be a serious place and an important place. So the way we dress is different, the way we act is different, the way we talk is different, but we don't want it to be so extreme, so, so crazy that I have to feel scared, like to take off my shoes. So actually the word for a shul, Beit Akneset, is really a great, great word, because Beit, you might recognize that word, is also the word Bait. It's oh. a home. So take a look around here. In, in many shuls, you might find things you'd find in a home. You find pictures or art on the wall. Look over here, there's some beautiful pictures of Eretz Yisrael. We have artwork. We have windows all over. We have couches to sit and carpets and all kinds of things, which I'm sure you see in many of your shows as well. It looks a little bit like a home, but then there's other spaces which are very, very special and a little bit different. So we try to have both. Oh, speaking of spaces, you know, one of my favorite things always was looking for secret spaces. Are there secret places in the show? Wow, secret places? I don't know. I don't think there's any secret places, although you kids probably know about the secret places in the shul more than I do. But there are some places that you may not have noticed before that I'd like to take you to, Rabbi Pepper, because maybe you haven't thought about them. Um, you know, our shul is a place where we not only care about connecting to Hashem, but we also care about people's health and people's safety. So many shuls have a first aid closet or room. So if ever you're hurt or in trouble, you know you can look there. So I'll show you the one over here um, in our shul, but I would ask you to go into your shuls and look to see if you have one as well. Ask your rabbi, ask your parents. So over here, we have this first aid closet. So anyone who has a problem on Shabbos, if they get hurt, if they need a Band-Aid, if they need some medicine, if they need even more special stuff, they can come right here to this closet and get what they need. So that's not a secret place. It's very open, very colorful. Everyone can see it, but it's also an important place. Another place that I spend a lot of time in that maybe you've never been to is the office. You mostly come to shul probably on Shabbos, but most of your shuls, I think, have an office where people work on setting up the shul 
and making sure the shul is running properly, and maybe even the rabbi has an office as well where he learns and where he teaches and where he meets with people. And if ever someone has something they want to discuss, they can come meet the rabbi. So here's our office. Your shul might have one as well. Over here is where um, people work on organizing the shul and running the shul. And then right in here uh, is my office. This is where I sit. This is where I learn. I have farm over here, lots of books, a place to sit comfortably with people. I have some light from the windows that comes in, a desk where I work, and I keep all my stuff here. So you're welcome to visit anytime. I don't think those are secret places, but they're good places for you to know about. Speaking of places, why does there have to be an Aron in the front of the shul? Ooh, actually, let's go into the shul so I can talk to you a little bit about the most important room of the shul, which is where we dial in. Actually, while we're on our way, you'll notice here something on the doorway, and I'm going to show you another one now. And that, of course, is a mezuzah. And it's very interesting to think about whether a mezuzah belongs in a shul. It's a fascinating question. Actually, the Torah says that we're supposed to put mezuzahs, al mezuzos beisecha uvisharecha. They're supposed to be on the doorways of your home and your gate. Now, we learned from that that you only put a mezuzah on a place that's like a bias, like a home. Now, I know I said a shul is a little bit like a home, but in the olden days, shuls were really only used for davening. And because of that, they actually didn't need a mezuzah because you don't eat there, you don't sleep there, you don't do any of the things like you do at home. So it actually doesn't need a mezuzah. Nowadays, we put mezuzahs everywhere. You have a mezuzah here, we have mezuzahs on all the entries of the shul, because we do a lot of other things in the shul as well. So it's also just special to have mezuzahs on our doors. This is one of the places where we daven. This is our main davening space. Um, and you asked about the aron, so if you come with me, I'll show you where the aron is. Uh, the aron is definitely in the front of the room, and right over there is like the center of the whole room. It's the focus of the whole room. So the Aron um, is right over here. You come up with me, I'll show it to you. It's very colorful, it's very big, everyone can see, everyone knows what it is and where it is. But I'll tell you a little bit more about it. First of all, the reason it's in the front of the room, like you asked, Rabbi Pepper, is because um, since it's so holy and so important, we want it to be the focus, we want it to be where everybody looks and thinks about. And also, we don't really want to have our back so much to the Aron. So if it was in the back of the room, at the side of the room, we'd have our backs to it, which wouldn't be nice. But the reason we have an Aron to begin with is because many things in the shul, and I'll show you some of them, um, are meant to remind us of another special place we've been reading about in the Torah a lot the last few weeks, and that is the Mishkan, or the Beis Hamikdash. If you remember, there was also an Aron. It was one of the most important um, vessels, one of the most important things inside the Mishkan was the Aron. And if you think about how the Aron was, there was a holy space in the Mishkan. Then there was a curtain which separated to go into a holier space called the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the holiest space only the Kohen Gadol once a year could go in there. And in that space, the only thing that was there was an Aron, which means a box. It was a golden box, which had a cover, it was sealed, totally enclosed, and inside was... I was there, I would ask you in person, but Rabbi Pepper knows the Luchos and the Torah. So we do the same thing. We're in this big room here. This is a holy place, special place. But then we come to the holiest place, and there's a curtain. Just like in the Mishkan, there was a parochas that separated between the Kodesh and the Kodesh HaKodeshim. So we have a curtain. We have a parochas over here. And on Shabbos, we sometimes open it. I'll open it now for you just so you can see. Behind that is closed doors. This whole box here of these closed doors is called the Aron, just like the Aron was closed on the top, on the sides. And, of course, inside we have the Torahs, just like in the Aron we had Torahs as well. So it's meant to remind us of the Aron, that holy, holy space that was in the Mishkan. If you take a look over here, Rabbi Pepper, you see we have a bunch of different Torahs, um, and they're all standing up in a very, very special way. We lean them up against this, the back and against the bottom to make sure they don't slip out. Some of your shoulders may have like a little chain or something like that, goes around. So on Shabbat or on the weekdays, when we get the Torah um, to be able to read it, someone comes up, someone opens this, it's a very special job. 
then the same person or even someone else has a job of taking out the Torah and giving it to the Chazan. The Chazan makes a special parade all the way to the place where it's being read and people come out of their seats and they, it's like a procession, like a king or a queen. I'm going to close this now because we're not using the Torah. So this is our Aron, and that's closed. And this is our Harochas. This is the curtain that separates between the spaces. Rabbi, some of the children wanted to know about the Ner Tamid above the Aron. Oh, yeah, there it is. You see right up there? Um, that's the Ner Tamid. Ner Tamid means candle that's always, constant candle. That's also, um, in order to remind us of something that was in the Beis HaMikdash, there was no Ner Tamid like this in the Mishkan of the Beis HaMikdash. There was a menorah, as you know. And um, the menorah, the Torah tells us, was Lahalos Ner Tamid. The word Tamid is always is in there. So it meant something was always burning on the menorah. We learned that the Ner Ma'aravi, one of the candles of the menorah, burned all the time. So even when the other candles burnt out, it just kept going and going. So to remember that, we also have a candle or a light that keeps going and going. And light in general is very important in our holy places, like in the shul, because light represents the idea that Hashem is present here. Light also represents Torah. Torah is light. It brings us clarity, makes things clear and beautiful and bright. And light is also about our neshama. It's about our soul. Our soul is compared to light as well. And so we have a place where it brings together Hashem and the Torah and the Jewish people all in one space, and that's represented by the light. Wow. Not only that, actually, um, there's not, that's the special light, but we also have a lot of other lights. Your shuls probably have them too. And that's not by accident. Rabbi, why do men, boys and girls, and men and ladies sit separately in shul? So here you see um, we have what's called a machitza. Machitza just means a separation or a wall. And that's, uh, I'm glad you asked that. And these are all connected questions. It's also because we want to remember the way things were in the Beis HaMikdash. The Beis HaMikdash, they built a special section um, where the men would be and a special section where the women would be. And so we try to do that because our shul has many, many different features, many different parts of it that are supposed to remind us of what it must have been like to be in the holiest place of the Beis HaMikdash. So we try to do that a little bit in different ways, including the way we sit. Thank you. Why is there a bima? Why do we need a bima to read from? Great. Can't we just use a table? Excellent question. Actually, Rabbi Pepper, you can just use a table. <laughs> in fact, there's nothing special about a bima. Really, you could read the Torah from any table, but most shuls try to have what's called a bima. This over here, if you can see, I don't know if you can see me over here, um, this is called an amud. This is normally where the person who leads davening stands. But that over there in the middle of the room is called a bima. Bima just means platform, actually, in Hebrew. Uh, but it's a special place where we read the Torah from. So when we read davening, it's usually up there. When we read the Torah, it's usually here in the middle of the room. And although you could just do it at a table, that would be fine. The reason why we have a special bima, which is in the middle of the room, if you notice, and I don't know if you can see here, but it's one step up. It's a little step up from everybody else, okay? That's also related to something that happened in the Beis HaMikdash. Once every seven years, there was a ceremony called Hakel, gathering. All the Jewish people, men, women, children, everybody came. And when they came into the Beis HaMikdash, they built a special platform like this, out of wood, that was raised off the floor. And the king of Israel would come and take out a Torah and read it from the bima in front of the whole Jewish people. So we want to remember that. That also reminds us of another time when Torah was read or taught in the middle, in an area that was raised. Maybe you can guess it, Rabbi Pepper. Can you think of another time in Jewish history? I'm going to give you a hint. It's not on a platform, but it's on a mountain. Oh. The Matan Torah. Matan Torah. Oh. So what we do in Shul on the Bima is supposed to remind us of the Beit HaMikdash. But what they did in the Beit HaMikdash, having the platform raised up in the middle with all the Jewish people around, was supposed to remind them of the first time Torah was taught, which is at Har Sinai. Because over there we learn that Moshe and Hashem spoke at the top of the mountain. Hashem taught Moshe the whole Torah. And the whole people were gathered all around the mountain. So when someone comes up here to read the Torah, and they're standing here in the middle, in fact, sometimes there's a couple of people around them. It's like that conversation between Hashem and Moshe, and Aaron was on a different level of the mountain. They're all up here. And then all of the people are around. So it's supposed to remind us of that great time of Matan Torah as well. 
Rabbi, why do we read the Torah in Shul? You could read the Torah elsewhere, but Torah reading is actually part of davening. And since we daven in the Shul, and you need a minion to be able to read the Torah, so it's usually the most convenient and natural place. And it's also a holier space where we keep the Torah. So I think that's why we read in the Shul generally. The shul is very beautiful, but why don't we build a shul to look like the Mishkan? So we built certain parts that are kind of like the Mishkan, because our shul is called a Mikdash Me'ad. It's a mini Mishkan, a mini Beis HaMikdash, but we're actually not allowed to build it to be exactly the same. We can't have the parts of the Beis HaMikdash exactly, exactly the same, because we have to remember that the only place for those very special things was in Yerushalayim, on the Har Habayis, in that special building. We can remind ourselves of it, and we can remember, but we can never feel like we're back there when we're really not. Rabbi, why do so many shuls have fake plants? I don't know. That's a very good question. I'm not sure I've ever seen fake plants in a shul. Maybe you have. Um, but I could think perhaps of a reason why plants are important in shul. Um, in general, we try to put plants or greenery or flowers in shul on Shavuos because Shavuos is the, the holiday where we celebrate Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, and we're told that when Hashem gave the Torah in Har Sinai, even though it was in the desert, everything was green, everything was blooming and was beautiful, so we try to remember that. Actually, now that you're mentioning the question, I'm looking at the parochet, and I'm realizing that we may not have fake plants, but we do have branches and leaves, so we do have plant-like things, and that's because the Torah is called Eitz Chaim He, it's a tree of life. So maybe when we see trees, we're supposed to think of the Torah. And trees also have this beautiful way of reaching up. You even look the way it's shaped here on the parochet. So maybe we're also supposed to remember that like a tree, we're supposed to grow from the ground, but we're also supposed to reach up to Hashem. Thank you for the question. I hadn't thought about that before. Can we daven in any room or specifically this room? There's so many rooms in the shul. You could daven elsewhere. It's not a problem to daven in any space. Actually, you can daven anywhere in the world. But it's all even better to daven in a place set aside specially for davening because of some of the reasons we mentioned before that it shows how important davening is. It helps you to concentrate. Everything's set up in the right way. It's facing the right way towards Yerushalayim. We have Torahs here available if you need. So that's why you try to daven in the rooms of the shul that are set aside for davening. But really, you could set that up in any other room as well. Oh, wow. And why do we read the parsha on other days besides for Shabbat? Well, Moshe Rabbeinu was very concerned. It was a very old, old practice. Moshe Rabbeinu was concerned that the Jewish people should never go three days without learning Torah. Now, Shabbos is the main time we learn Torah or hear the Torah reading because that's the main time people can have the time to gather together because they're not at work. But he wanted to make sure not three days ever pass by without us learning. So he put it on Monday and Thursday, make sure, okay, you have Shabbos, then maybe Sunday goes by, but then at least Monday you have Torah. And Tuesday, Wednesday go by, but at least Thursday you have Torah. Okay, Friday, but then Shabbos you have Torah. So we never can go without Torah. It's our life. It's everything. So we have to have it all the time. Wow, that's so amazing. You mentioned that Shabbat is a special day. Why do we have different tefillot for Shabbat and for the weekday? There are a few reasons for that. That's an excellent question. Um, one of them is we just have more time. During the week, we're in a rush. People have to go to work. They have to go to school. So davening is important, but it can only be so long. But on Shabbos, we have a little more time. It's the day we want to connect to Hashem. So we add in more tefillot. That's one aspect of it. But the main difference that maybe is what you're thinking about is that the Amida, the main tefillah that we say every day, three times a day, the Shemona Esrei, that some people call it, um, is very different on Shabbos than it is during the week. So if you know, during the week, the Shemona Esrei has 19 brachos, 19 blessings, three in the beginning, three in the end, and 13 in the middle. The 13 in the middle are called bakashos, the things that we ask for. We ask Hashem to give us wisdom, to make us smart. We ask Hashem uh, to give us health. We ask Hashem to help us do tshuva. We ask Hashem to bring us back to Yerushalayim, all those great things. So on Shabbos, we're not really supposed to ask for things for ourselves. It's more of a day than we think about. The day of Shabbos, we connect to Hashem. So all those middle blessings are replaced with one blessing that's about the theme of Shabbos. That's why we can't say the regular weekday Shemona Esrei on Shabbos. And speaking of Shabbos, why do we make Kiddush in Shul and at home? 
So many people do that, you're right, and we actually do that here. Maybe in some of your shows you do that as well. So there's a few reasons for it. First of all, some people do that in shul Friday night. At the end of davening Friday night, they have Kiddush, and then they go home and make Kiddush at home. I don't know if that's what you were referring to. The reason for that is because once upon a time, people who were traveling always knew that a safe place to go was a shul. If they had nowhere to stay, nowhere to live, they could always go to a shul. So there might have been people who were in shul Friday night who were going to go to a different room in the shul or somewhere outside the shul and eat their Friday night meal or even sleep there. And they would have nowhere to hear Kiddush. So they made Kiddush and shul to make sure everyone can hear it. Nowadays, most people have a home to go to or they go to someone else as a guest and so they'll hear Kiddush, but we still try to do that in shul just in case. But also it's a beautiful way. Kiddush is about welcoming Shabbos and what better way to do that with everybody around you. During the daytime, some shuls also make kiddush at the end of davening if they're going to have a kiddush, like snack type foods, where they have uh, sometimes after davening. So then the reason why we do that and then say kiddush again at home before lunch is for a different reason. Um, kiddush, there's two reasons for kiddush, especially on Shabbos day. One is um, in order to be able to eat or taste anything after you finish davening, you really have to make kiddush first. So we do that in shul so that then people can eat at the kiddush. But kiddush is also something that has to be connected to the meal so that it makes the meal very, very special. So even if you hear kiddush in shul, before lunch, you still make kiddush at home again. Thank you, Rabbi. There's one more question from the students. Please. They wanted to know why there are so many different types of sidurim. Oh, beautiful question. Let me show you, actually. Um, while we're walking, I'll tell you that in different shuls, they have sidurim and humashim in different places. So you always have to watch out where you are. So some shuls actually, if you look here, have these benches that open. You know, there's nice compartments underneath like this. So some shuls actually keep the sidurim in here so you can walk straight into the davening space, open it up, and find your sitter. Other shuls like ours actually keep them outside so that when you're trying to find your sitter, you're not disturbing everybody who's davening. So we keep them on these shelves, and we have a whole bunch of kinds of sidurim over here. So we have um, the Arts Girl Sidur, we have an old Sidur called the Tikkun Meir, we have the Koran Sidur, we even have the Koran Sidur that you, some of you use at school. We have these smaller Sidurim, we have a Sephardic Sidur for Sephardic Jews, people who daven in that way. We have Sidurim with Braille, we have so many types of Sidurim here for people who are blind. The reason for that is because we want davening to be such a great experience, tefillah, to be so important to every individual person, and everyone has a different style. I may like this font, you may like that font, the way the letters look. I may like the pages that are very thin, you may like the pages that are thick, you may like a big book, I may like a small book. So everyone gets to choose. Some people like, on the sitter, they have, sometimes at the bottom of the page, they have a commentary, some explanations of the davening. So some people like the explanations in this sitter. Some people like the explanations in the others. Some people like to switch off. What we're really trying to do by giving people so many sidurim is make davening special to them. And I hope you guys can do that too. Make davening the most special for you. You have to connect to it. It has to be your davening. So many people can daven the exact same word that every one of their tfilos is different because it's coming from you from me, from Rabbi Pepper, and that makes it very special to Hashem as well. So whatever can give you the greatest experience, choose the right sitter, choose the right shul, choose the right spot in shul, choose the right person to sit next to, choose the right things to focus on to make davening and tefillah so special to you, and Shabbos so special to you. Oh, thank you. So it really is a Beit Knesset, it's a place for everyone. Yeah. It wow. really is a place. I'll end off with telling you something really interesting, actually, about that word, Beit Knesset. And we'll come full circle here to our entry, where we started this conversation about the shul and the Beit HaKnesset. There was a famous shul where a lot of Jews used to gather. And the Gemara tells us, the rabbis in the Gemara tell us, that actually they made sections in the shul where people had to sit according to their job. So the people that, I don't know, were teachers, let's say, had to sit in the teacher section, or Pepper, you'd have to sit in the teacher section. Uh, the people who were rabbis had to sit in the rabbi section. The people who worked on a farm had to sit in the farm section. The people who worked on uh, fixing clothes had to sit in that section. Why did they do that? We believe they did that because Jews coming to shul not only have to connect to Hashem, but they have to connect to each other. 
They have to have something that they can relate to each other, can talk to each other about, can connect with each other, say, oh, you're, you're a teacher? I'm a teacher. What did you teach last week? What can I learn from you? Oh, you work on a farm? I need a job on a farm. Can I come work for you? Can I help you in some way? Do you have a tractor? He has a tractor. Look over there. Go get his tractor. It's a way we come together. We help each other. The purpose of a shul, the reason we don't daven here, there, and other, we all come to shul, is because it's special for Hashem, but also special to connect to each other. Thank you so much, Ray Weinberg. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat, everyone.